NYU is uh, Robert Wagner School of Public Service. He's, he's, he's a pro prolific researcher. He's a well-known author. Um, he's a prominent development economist. His research focuses on the areas of social investment, microfinance, uh, poverty, and equality. Um, he's also the director, managing director of a uniquely innovative consortium of researchers called the Financial Access Initiative, which aims to expand financial services to low-income uh, income families in the developing countries. And in this capacity and many other capacities, he's proven to us time and again that academia can indeed step out of the university walls and make a real difference in the world around us. Since the Henry George program, uh, as you know, is, is named after Henry George, who was a social reformer and economist in the 19th century, um, who uh, championed the cause of economic justice, it is indeed our pleasure today to welcome Jonathan Murdoch. Uh, nobody would have been more suitable today to be here with us. Thank you, sir. I welcome you. I've been looking forward to this uh, with a lot of pleasure. And uh, I know it's such a beautiful day out, and it's so close to graduation. And to see all of you uh, here who I'm sure are thinking about lots of things, papers, exams, sunshine, um, the summer, um, I'm really glad that we can all take a few minutes uh, to talk about some new ideas. And so thank you for having me here to talk about um, some of the new work that I've been engaged in. I've been spending a lot of time thinking about an idea that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, today. And that idea is microcredit and microfinance and the idea of spreading banks around the world to people who never had access um, to banks as we all take for granted. So I've been thinking a lot about microcredit and I decided to come here and not talk about that. Or only talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about something new. And I realized that in my career what I've tended to do is be a bit slow on the uptake. I've tended to sort of wait until everyone else kind of discovers a great idea, and then I kind of slowly find my way to it and start writing a few things and try to see if there's anything interesting left to say. And I feel like this is a topic which is ripe for that kind of analysis. Um, the idea is social investment, and it's uh, very connected to some of the ideas that Henry George um, was putting forward, very connected to, I think, part of the mission of this university, what makes this university special? Um, the idea of taking ideas from academia and trying to understand whether they can contribute to a, a better world, a world that's more just, more fair, um, that gives more opportunities. So thank you very much for inviting me um, today. I want to start, let's see if I can start. Start by um, reviewing a few numbers on the state of our planet in terms of wealth and inequality. There are lots of ways we can think about the planet, but I came across a few numbers um, last week that I thought were really stunning, and I want to share them with you. And these numbers were stunning to me because they very neatly capture a problem, I think, that many of us see, which is that this world has become incredibly rich. Our planet is incredibly wealthy despite all that we understand about global warming and difficulties that we all face, in a historical perspective, this planet is incredibly wealthy. And it is also, from a historical perspective, incredibly <coughs> unequal. And that is the start of what I want to say. So here's the data that I came across. This is data that was put together by a World Bank researcher named Branko Milanovic. And he is a guy who looks very carefully at data, and he took some new price figures from 2005, purchasing power parity exchange rates. All of you economists who are thinking about international stuff will know what PPP exchange rates are. But the basic idea is to take global data on incomes and to try to convert it as closely as possible uh, to give comparable uh, measures of purchasing power in different countries. And he took data from around the world, about 150 countries, 
and he lined up the data so that he could create a measure of uh, global well-being from the very, very poorest person to the very, very richest, and broke that sample up into 10 bins and um, created a measure of global income distribution. And the first thing that he saw, one of the things that comes out of the data, is that the bottom 10% on our planet command less than 1%, 0.61 of a percentage point, <coughs> less than 1% of global purchasing power. Now, if the world was completely equal, which of course it isn't, the bottom 10% would command 10% of purchasing power, but less than 1% for the bottom, um, the bottom decile. The next decile, about a percent, and the decile after that, 1.25%, and the decile after that, 2.05%. So if we look at the bottom 40% of the world's population, the bottom 40% commands only 4.4% of global purchasing power. <coughs> that is a marker of how unequal our planet has become. And most of that bottom 40% uh, is living on under $2 a day per person. So a staggeringly low amount. But what was stunning about the data is that it's not just um, big numbers or striking numbers on the low end, but on the high end as well. We look at the top two deciles, the top 20%. We can see that their income is huge. The top 20% today commands 77% of global purchasing power. That creates a world in which the haves have a lot more than ever and the have-nots have much less. And in a way, it sets up a dilemma in terms of our ability to change that equation. You know, the, the Bible tells us about the Samaritan, and the, from that we have the Samaritan's dilemma. How do you give? How do you change the world? How do you um, give charity most effectively? And we have a, a global version of that. Never in history have the world's rich been in a position to do so much for the world's poor. And the question I want to start with is that that's a challenge. And the challenge is why don't we do more? What are the reasons? And are there ways to, uh, to be more effective in achieving those goals? So why don't we do more? First, just the basic data uh, to set the scene. This is data on foreign aid, foreign assistance. It doesn't include, this is official assistance, it doesn't include a lot of charity, um, that would change the numbers somewhat. But we can see that from 1960 up to 2008, global foreign aid, this is foreign aid from the European countries, the US, Japan, has been falling, and it's about 0.3%. So when Jeffrey Sachs, the great Columbia University economist, and Bono, the great Irish economist, um, when they argue for foreign aid, they, they say we should get to 0.7% um, in terms of disbursement. But um, we see we're nothing like that. So why are, aren't we more generous? What are the reasons? Why aren't those numbers higher? I ask. I was actually told by um, uh, a faculty member here that I can make this interactive by engaging you in conversation. So let's see if that works. So why, why, um, why are those numbers low? Why do you think the American voter, for example, are reluctant to devote more money to foreign aid? So that's a really important issue. And there's a lot to be said for that, giving money to America first. Any other thoughts about why foreign aid seems particularly difficult or charity seems particularly difficult in this time? Fears, whether real or not. Yeah. Really important. You know, George Bush said, if you can prove to me that the money is not going to go down some rat hole, I'll be there with the money. That was before he set up um, one of the great um, innovations he made, um, giving all the money for um, AIDS and um, malaria and other diseases. Fear of a rat hole, lack of accountability, really important. Any other thoughts? Well, those are really uh, 
really important issues. And, and, um, and that's right. And this is a picture of Imelda Marcos' shoes, um, which is for one example of a fear of what happens um, to foreign aid that will be pulled away um, through corruption. Um, this is Mrs. Marcos's you know, thousand pairs of shoes that were discovered um, in the Philippines, obviously sort of skimmed off or skimmed off due to corruption. We think of uh, in Zaire, Mobutu um, taking five billion uh, dollars in corruption, it's estimated. Uh, we think about lots of examples, but it's more than that. It's not just the big kleptocrats, it's the day-to-day -day things or the year-to-year -year things. A study in Kenya, for example, showing that money that was supposed to go uh, from the government, education ministry, to schools based on a per capita basis just to um, build more schools. Of 250 schools that were surveyed, almost all of them reported receiving nothing. Local officials instead um, got hold of the money first. Of the schools that got anything, um, the average they got was 13% of what they were due. So there's a fear and justifiable concerns around accountability. This is, uh, to me, a really striking graph that comes from Bill Easterly, my colleague at NYU, showing um, per capita growth in Africa falling while um, aid is rising. Right? So what you see in this graph is that the story that aid increases lead to growth increases clearly is not popping out. Now, to be fair, part of it is that when growth is low, then there's a response in terms of more aid. But the causation from more aid to more growth um, is hard to establish, which reinforces the issues with accountability and corruption. And there's perhaps a, another sort of less often articulated concern, which is just that the problems are so big. They're so enormous that anything that any of us can do, either as an individual or even as a government, the government of the United States, is just so small relative to the needs. It's just a drop in the ocean. It's just a drop in the ocean. So whether we give 0.3% or 0.4% or 0.7% um, is small relative to the broader concern. And that, kind of in a nutshell, you know, the fear of creating dependency, the lack of accountability, the size of problems, I think drive this dilemma that at no other time they said in history have we been so able to give and yet perhaps um, so reluctant. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is some ideas that I think are pretty exciting about potential ways to change that equation and to do it through the notion of social investment. The gaps are huge, as we said, but there are gaps in particular markets, particular access to institutions, agriculture, power, Electricity, uh, healthcare, environmental technologies, communications, the thing I work on, capital, credit, banking. All of these are gaps. And what I want to suggest is that there may well be solutions if we reimagine and think creatively about them. One approach is to embrace the idea of markets, to bring markets. Um, to fill these gaps. Right? Rather than thinking about aid, thinking about enabling markets. No one is more articulate about the power of markets, the magic of markets, than say Ronald Reagan. Right? And in Ronald Reagan's view, the societies which have achieved the most spectacular broad-based economic progress in the shortest period of time are not the most tightly controlled, nor necessarily the biggest in size, or the wealthiest in natural resources. Know what unites them all is their willingness to believe in the magic of the marketplace. What I want to suggest is there's a lot of power in that vision, but it's not enough. It's not enough to guarantee that the market will stretch to the most underserved, will innovate in ways that are going to create justice and fairness and efficiency, even in very narrow economic terms. So markets can be vibrant. They have accountability. It's great. You can walk away, you can vote with your feet, um, they can be far-reaching, they can handle an incredible amount of complexity, they can be very flexible. So markets are incredible tools, which is why so many of us are economists or involved in finance. So we know the power of um, economics and finance. But we also know, and we were reminded in the last year or two with the financial crisis, um, that markets aren't always perfect. 
that there can be informational asymmetries. It's very hard to see um, what's happening on the other side of a transaction sometimes, and that can undermine the ability um, to improve um, well-being on both sides. There can be cultural biases. Markets can be consistent, can even reinforce discrimination. Well, in other cases, better cases, it can um, diminish it. Scale economies pose problems. There's a capacity for exploitation. Um, and regulation is always an issue that we're struggling with. And we're struggling with now as we think about um, addressing the, um, the crisis. So markets are an important part of going forward. Um, but we also have a, another language and another set of concerns about the flaws in markets or the limits to markets. The idea of social investment is a very simple one. The idea of social investment is that one can use philanthropic money, redeploy philanthropic money or public money, government money, to take markets to places they ordinarily wouldn't go, to crowd in private, for-profit commercial investment. And the idea is to catalyze markets, to shift them, to change equations, um, and in so doing, do two things at the same time, which is to attract more capital into places like Sub-Saharan Africa to address you know, lack of water or lack of credit or environmental issues, attract more capital while at the same time addressing market failures. That that has to be done at the same time. And in doing that, improve distribution and also the efficiency of systems. So this isn't just about doing good and getting more resources to the have-nots. It's about increasing the efficiency of economic systems. Okay. And it's already happening. We see, and we think of social investors. We're going to think about social investment, we're going to think about social investors. A social investor, whether it's a government agency or an individual, is someone who invests partly with the idea of creating some social good. And as a uh, corollary of that, is willing to sacrifice some amount of financial gain. So there's an opportunity cost. And that's what we think about as social investor. And you know, there are a lot of different models of social investors. Some of them, maybe, maybe some of you. How many people have heard of an organization called Kiva.org? Some of you. Um, Kiva is a website. Kiva allows you to get on the web and lend money to somebody in Ecuador, a woman starting a small business. You can do it. You lend her money. She'll pay it back. You get zero interest, which is not that different from what you get by keeping in your bank, but you get zero interest, but you're helping this woman in Ecuador grow her business, uh, get a bank loan that she otherwise wouldn't get, and you can make a difference. Spread a market. That's social investment. S logging on to Kiva, making a loan is being a social investor. But that's aggregating into bigger um, quantities, the Calvert funds. Um, TII CREF, which most of us who are in academia, uh, a lot of our pension money is um, run through them. They have a social fund, which does that at a large scale. Acumen Fund, um, based out of New York, is uh, a venture capital firm, essentially, investing in the same way um, in green technologies, in banking um, for the poor, in ambulance services in Africa, um, with the same idea. Foundations are doing this through what they call PRIs, program-related investments, making investments that aren't going to give them maximal returns at all. They're giving up a lot, but they're gaining a lot on the social side. Um, and governments are doing it. And this is one of the things I've been trying to think through, the extent to which what we think of as public finance really could be put under this rubric. Fannie Mae, for example, which is a sort of complicated case to talk about these days. But Fannie Mae was an example of a government trying to you know, invest in an institution that would enhance markets and crowd in um, capital to bring uh, services and markets to people who were otherwise underserved. Okay. We've learned a lesson about Fannie Mae and the difficulty of doing that, um, but the vision um, is very strong and we see it in lots of cases. And the basic vision is about tipping an equation, an equation that isn't working because um, people might not want to go into or lending in Bangladesh, say, in the slums because perceived risks and uh, startup costs are too high and there are incentive problems, and so they don't do it. And what social investment is about is 
helping with some initial funding or even long-term funding, so-called patient capital, which changes um, that balance. So that is the big issue. I want to do a couple things. I want to give an example of a couple of places where I think some of this is really exciting. I also want to step back right now and locate this within broader economic thought. This is probably the most famous quote from The Wealth of Nations. Um, how many people have read The Wealth of Nations? Some of them. Picked it up, felt it, looked at it, seen it on the shelf, have it on the shelf, heard of it, some of you. The Wealth of Nations is a great book. Um, and uh, it's full of colorful lines. Uh, and this is probably the, m the most famous. Um, it is not from the ben benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. It's a very strong argument that um, if we let free markets work without impediment, people will find it in their own interest to produce, to work hard, and um, to maximize social surplus. That's the foundation, although in very different language, is the foundation of a lot of modern economics. So it's very powerful and put a lot better than most of today's economists could probably uh, make an argument. So it's interesting that you know, he's, he's criticizing benevolence in a sense. He's saying, don't be benevolent. Just act in your self-interest and stop getting in the way with your well-intentioned ideas. And yet, I gotta put out that social investment starts with benevolence. It's about benevolence. And it says, let's take that benevolence, let's own that benevolence, and let's do something powerful with it. But not just anything, let's think about gaps. Let's think about where there are impediments and use our benevolence, use our resources to overcome them, to then catalyze more action. So, Pareto efficiency, right? This is a term that um, all of you who are economists have come across, right? Pareto optimality, Pareto efficiency. This is what's supposed to be so special about, and is so special about free markets under um, usual conditions. The idea of a free market, if you can trade freely, it should be that no one could be made better off in the system without someone else being made worse off. Right? Because it's all voluntary and it's all free exchange. And that's a very powerful quality to have in a system. What's <coughs> I think, uh, often left out, because we're not thinking about altruists, right? We're just thinking about normal people. When we think about altruists, they can make things better. Even a, a situation that seems Pareto efficient can be made better if you introduce altruists. Because altruists have a very special quality. They're willing to take a loss. They want to. They're willing to be made worse off in a material way if it'll make the world better off, if it'll make other people better off. That's their power. And with that, and the idea of social investment is that one can then absorb the costs of particular impediments that get in the way of the spread of market. Costs of experimentation, for example, which you know, businesses might not want to do because when they experiment, they learn things, everyone else learns it, it becomes a public good, and we tend to underinvest in public goods. They can uh, absorb the cost of having to uh, give incentive pay or to reach particularly costly customers in far off villages and uh, regions. That's the power of social investment. So, I guess. Uh, should want to bring this uh, somewhat up to the future by uh, introducing Joe Stiglitz um, because I made a claim about free markets that they're Pareto efficient, right? Free trade. Joe Stiglitz, um, Nobel Prize winner, Columbia professor, um, used to be chief economist at the World Bank and um, at the Council of Economic Advisors, you know, very strongly argues that, uh, and I think in one of your classes you were reading Freefall, his, his new book, um, very strongly argues that, in fact, free markets can't be assumed to be Pareto efficient, like I argued. And he argues be that's because there are so many um, there are barriers to free exchange because of lack of information. And he argues that the lack of information and the lack of accountability and the lack of ability to enforce contracts 
makes it so that there can be situations where poor households say, let's think about a bank. Poor households want to get a loan. And they say, they go to the bank and they say, I'd like a loan. I'm willing to work hard. I've got a great business idea. And the banker says, you know, I'm not willing to lend to you because you don't have enough assets. You don't have enough collateral to secure that loan to make me feel comfortable that this isn't going to be a risky project. The poor household says, no, I've got a great idea. And I am, I've got a, you know, a few assets you can have. They don't really have title, formal title. And the bank says, you really can't do it. And time after time, millions and millions of times, poor households are denied loans, denied access to capital, denied access to the resources that could give them new opportunities and a chance to grow their way out of poverty. That, the essential problem of having a lack of assets in economic terms is called la limited liability. Right? They don't have, because they don't have assets, then the problem is they don't have, um, they, they wouldn't be exposed, because nothing can be taken away from them, they wouldn't be exposed to the downside of their actions if they don't work hard enough, if they don't put in enough effort, if they aren't dil diligent enough, they aren't exposed to the downside of their actions. And that worries the bank, and that's why the bank doesn't lend. So what Joe Stiglitz says is that in those situations, even a free market isn't going to deliver the best of all possible options, and income redistribution can make the world not only a more justly distributed place, but can also increase efficiency, can increase the size of the pie. And so modern economics has started to sort of create a language, or at least a theoretical framework, that allows us to start thinking about income redistribution and asset redistribution leading to better working economies. That's a very profound shift in the way that economics views philanthropy, charity, redistribution. But what I want to argue is that that's only one option of a way to use resources, to redistribute. What I want to argue with social investment is that often a better way is not to redistribute to individuals, but to use resources to build up institutions. Not to give, not necessarily, and this isn't an either or, but not necessarily to give assets to someone so they can go to the bank and be in a better position, but use assets to fundamentally reimagine what a bank can be like. That's what I want to argue. I'm going to give you some examples. So let me uh, move to that. Um, I'm just going to say something about Henry George, link it in here, because Henry George also is someone very focused on wealth and inequality, and also someone who recognized that inequality of assets, inequality of um, access to resources can create exploitation and unfair outcomes and, um, and gross inefficiencies. And I want to suggest that as we think about the possibilities that someone like Henry George would put forward of attacking the root problems, just like Joseph Stiglitz, which is all about um, redistribution or, or interventions that uh, try to address maldistribution, what social investment is doing is saying, let's do something different, um, which is reimagining basic economic institutions. Okay. So that's the, that's the story. That's where I'm going. Um, this is the philosophy. Um, this is the bottom line. Focus on building new institutions that can provide access to poor people, landless people, and assetless people. Okay. If, uh, if I wanted to pick one proponent of this view, and there aren't actually a lot. I mean, this is a... So Mohamed Yunus, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for uh, Grameen Bank and Microcredit, uh, just wrote a new book, came out last week, on social business. So he's one person. But here's another, Bill Gates. I always like that picture. He kind of looks like there's a halo around him. Um, and Bill Gates has been a great proponent of what he calls creative capitalism. And it's very much in line here, but it's just an idea he put forward. Then he created a website. These days, when you have an idea on a website, it feels like it's a real idea. Um, but I think we need to go further than the idea on the website. I think we need to do some serious economics um, to get a, a little further. And what Bill Gates says is 
you know, as we think about the problems of the world, when he thinks about how he should use the billions of dollars that are, are in his foundation, he knows that even with the world's biggest foundation, he can't change the world. And, and to do that, he's really been pushing an idea of reimagining capitalism. And in his words, capitalism harnesses self-interest in a helpful and sustainable way, but only on behalf of those who can pay. We need a system that draws in innovators and businesses in a far better way. And so what we're going to be talking about as we go forward is thinking about for-profit investment together with so-called impact investment, which is at below market returns, but with a social impact, and also public funding. So here's some examples. First example, um, combating blindness. Blindness is a huge problem. Globally, uh, the figures now, about 37 million people globally are blind. Um, 161 million people have serious vision problems. That number is expected to go to 75 million by the year 2020, and most live in developing countries. So in the sort of least good position to deal with this problem. Most of the problems are due to three uh, particular conditions, cataracts, trachoma, or glaucoma, and they're all treatable, mostly. 75% um, can be cured or prevented. The problem is that most of the people who are in developing countries don't have access to the medical assistance um, and services that can help them uh, be treated for their vision problems. And so most of those 75 million blind people um, are blind um, for reasons that, um, that are preventable. And that's a great, uh, it's a great problem. And the question is, can we do something better? I want to focus on cataracts. Now, cataracts are a problem with um, a sort of clouding of the lens. This is what happens when you have cataracts. Your vision gets blurry. It's hard to earn a living. It's hard to engage with your family. It's a real, really debilitating vision problem. Um, and there are a number of different solutions to uh, cataracts. One of the most effective is what they call an intraocular lens implant implantation. They actually put a, um, a lens underneath the cornea. Um, it's a very routine surgery now, and it's fairly low cost, about $3,000 to $3,500. Pretty low cost to us relative to getting your sight back. Um, but if you're living on $2 a day, that's out of reach. So I want to tell you about a, um, an eye clinic uh, in India, in South India, uh, based in Hyderabad, the Aravind Eye Clinic. It was started by a doctor, Venkata Swami, um, affectionately known as Dr. V. And he set up an eye clinic to specifically confront these problems. And his vision is that seeing is a human right. It's a right of every human being, and no one should remain blind due to the lack of simple delivery of eye care. And so he translated that vision into a series of hospitals. He has hospitals, he has smaller clinics, he has storefront shops where people can come in and be seen by a um, specialist on certain days. The model is interesting. Is he's committed to doing this for the social good. But to do that, and to work with as many people as possible, he has customers who are paying. And then he realizes, then they're among the better off people in the community. And then he realizes that there are people who could pay something. And so another group pays two thirds of the full price. And the largest single group pays nothing for their eye services. He's what we call a social entrepreneur. And he's built a very, very successful um, model for eye services. So I have a friend named Assad Mahmoud who works, he's in charge of uh, social investments at Deutsche Bank. And Mahmoud just closed a <laughs> new fund uh, called the iFund. Um, this is iFund 1, and this is the structure of it, to give you a sense of how social investment works in practice. It's a, a sort of structured um, product with $2 million worth of equity at the base of it, given by donors who want to see something happen. So they've got resources, they want to see something happen, and they're getting no return. They're equity holders. Then you've got so-called social investors. This is really the group that I'm focused on here 
they're getting a very modest return of 1%. And they're also, um, they've got subordinated debt. So they're also absorbing more of the risk. And then on top of that, you've got senior debt in the amount of $14 million, um, which is being sold at commercial levels. Here are 6%. The vision here for social investment is to put together philanthropists and commercial investors, leverage the ability to absorb risk and the desire to create change on the part of the social investors, bring in others who aren't really that necessarily that crazy about eye hospitals, but bring them together to create something new. And this eye fund, the idea of it is to take the ideas from Arvind and to spread them in Africa, to spread them elsewhere in Asia, um, to make this go much further. That's one simple example of a social investment. And the idea is supporting the social enterprise rather than just redistributing um, directly. Because you know, the idea we have when we redistribute directly is that you can get resources to people and then hopefully maybe people like Dr. V will respond and create new institutions. But the social investment philosophy or vision is support people like Dr. V and help them create the institutions that are going to serve the population. So don't wait. Don't give money and just wait and hope that something's going to happen. Instead, be much more proactive, be much more deliberate, and um, spur action. So that's eyes. I want to talk a little bit about something I actually know much more about, which is microfinance. Right? So I want to talk very briefly about the rise of microfinance. And it's a very similar story. And in fact, it inspired a lot of the other work in social um, investment. This is Muhammad Yunus, truly inspiring visionary who started, as many of you probably know, a bank in Bangladesh called Grameen Bank, which works in some of the poorest villages. Okay. This is a replication of Grameen Bank. This um, is a picture from Mali. And what Muhammad Yunus did was to reimagine banking so that you know, people wouldn't have to come and you know, offer collateral and assets, which they didn't have to begin with. So what Muhammad Yunus imagined to break that cycle of poverty, you'd get people to get capital to people who didn't have it, uh, was to create Grameen Bank, which built on the networks and relationships that customers themselves had, formed them into groups, build trust, build relationships over time, build a banking structure based on relationships. And in doing that, he now serves, I think, about 8 million people in Bangladesh. There are about 20 million people in Bangladesh served totally because there are some replicators. And globally, um, microfinance now serves, figure here, um, microfinance now serves uh, about a little over 155 million customers um, at the last count. So an amazing um, transformation. That has been accomplished through social investment. When Muhammad Yunus started, he was committed to charging interest rates that are not giveaways. His loans cost 20% at least um, per year. Right? So there's a kind of commercial business model behind it. But in the beginning, there were social investors. The government of Japan just gave uh, a lot of money in 1995, the Ford Foundation, the Norwegian aid agencies. They were all social investors catalyzing this idea from Muhammad Yunus and then taking it forward. Today, the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, um, others around the world are doing the same kind of social investment. So I've got a few more um, comments uh, briefly around um, microfinance that I want to put forward because it, it it takes us to a wrinkle or a complication, um, or in some ways a justification for social investment. So now that we've got established this idea, I want to talk about some next steps. This, um, this scatter of um, data from different institutions, these are microfinance institutions around the world. So I put this data together with some colleagues at the World Bank. This is World Bank data from something called the mixed market. And what this says, you can't read it, but it says operating expenses. Um, so essentially, operating expenses per dollar loaned. Okay? This is the cost of running a microfinance institution. This is the average loan size provided by that microfinance institution. And the basic relationship I just want to lay out is that it's a lot more costly to serve 
customers who are looking for small scale transactions. So if you're a customer who comes in, you want a million dollar loan, that's going to take a lot of work and due diligence and paperwork and following up and all that. But you know, it's a million dollar loan, so it's uh, probably worth doing it for the bank. If you came in wanting a hundred thousand dollar loan, it's probably worth it. If you want a ten thousand dollar loan, it's still pretty big, although a normal bank might decide it's not really worth it to look into it. But Muhammad Yunus is making hundred dollar loans. Hundred dollar loans are really expensive to make. They were require a lot of diligence. And remember, he's, he's making them without collateral, without requiring collateral. And this is why costs are so high. And this is the power of social investment, because it can catalyze the innovations and also provide some underlying support that makes banking possible when you're serving these populations. I want to show you something some of my colleagues in microfinance aren't that crazy about, uh, but it really makes my point. This blue line at the top is data on the profitability of the reported profitability of microfinance institutions. And again, I've got loan sizes here. It goes from 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 dollars. Okay. So these are the small ones. And all banks, this, is, this red line um, is called financial self-sufficiency, but it's basically a profitability measure. The red line is the zero profit line. So if you're above that, you're making profits. If you're below it, you're making losses. And according to self-reports, which is the top blue line, everyone's making profits. But I've gone back to the data and looked at the like, true cost of capital. And if you recalculate profits based on sort of normal accounting standards that you're all familiar with, um, it turns out that most banks actually, in terms of real cost of capital, uh, are not making profits. Most of these microfinance banks. You could say, well, that's terrible. You know, they should be making profits if they're a bank. But this is the vision of social investment. If there are people looking to make a difference, who have the resources to catalyze action, and we saw a huge expansion of this sector, uh, there really is a potential to support these institutions, hopefully transition them to something more profitable, um, but clearly there's a, a need. And here's the scale. We talk about just being a drop in the ocean, but here's the scale in microfinance. 2008, donors and investors were putting in $3 billion. This was new commitments, which was a 20% increase over the past year. So we're getting to some real numbers. Total open commitments, again, in, at the end of 2008, um, were almost $15 billion. So by taking a very simple idea, by getting some people together who are willing to support it, and then bringing in commercial funding, you can get up to some scales that can start to make macro differences. A few more quick points. I want to suggest that these kinds of activities are broad. That we're used to thinking about, in our economics classes, our finance classes, only one quadrant in an economy, which is commercial businesses being supported by commercial funding, free enterprise. We also have some idea around Grameen Bank, which is a social enterprise being supported by social investment. But what I want to suggest in the world that we're going to be inhabiting you know, over the next decade is that more and more we're going to be seeing social enterprises, maybe like hospitals that are largely supported by commercial money, and also Let's get this right. Um, commercial enterprises, and this is the really tricky box. Commercial enterprises. Compartamos, a big Mexican bank that had an IPO that um, went for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, a lot of investments from the International Finance Corporation. Commercial enterprises that are being supported by social investment. That's the vision, but it's a complicated vision. Um, when there's somebody out there um, and most of the people are making profits off these investments. And that's where, say, this is Gates' creative capitalism. That's, I think, where a lot of the issues are going to be. That's where the world is that we're moving to. And all of the banks in New York are thinking hard about this world. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, all of them. It's in an increasingly large part of not just the private side, but also um, uh, public finance. So that's the issue 
it's going to be tricky. You know, I mean, social investment is not an easy thing. There are not always a lot of transactions in these institutions, unlike IBM or Walmart or Microsoft. Um, we often see low volumes that make it hard to judge um, the robustness of cash flows. Liquidity issues are um, often problems. So it's not an easy sector, it's a difficult sector. You know, Warren Buffett said, you know, when, I, when he looks at you know, philanthropy and making investments in the space, he says, you know, when I'm doing, making commercial investments with Berkshire Hathaway, that's easy, I pick the easy wins. Here what we're trying to do is find the hardest things to do and to pull them off. So this is not easy, um, but it, we're making a lot of progress. The last thought, I want to link this back, because what, ultimately what I want to move toward is working toward an equivalent of corporate finance, but that explains this space, social finance. And the one idea I just want to put out really briefly is the idea of leverage, because that's the power of social investment. You can leverage resources. As we've seen, you put in philanthropic money, brings in other money, you can leverage it. So I just have one or really two things I want to say on that. Um, in, uh, in wrapping up. So I wanna move to one picture. So I'm gonna flip through something to get to, um, to this, which is what we just saw, that on the low end, small scale transactions, much more costly, harder to make profits. Okay, just hold that thought. And I wanna suggest that it helps explain this. This is one of the, one of the ways in which when we think about leverage in the space, we need to be realistic. This is microfinance institutions. Some serve the poorest, some are kind of in the middle, some are high end making $10,000 loans. When we look at leverage, this is equity, the bigger the dark blue line that's pretty close approximation to being le much less leveraged. Um, all the leverage comes from the high end. That's where you can really get leverage, that's where you can really multiply your money, that's where you can really crowd in commercial money. On the low end, when you're working with the poorest, families, of course communities, where you think you can make the biggest social difference, it also tends to be where leverage empirically is least. That's a real challenge. And so the first thing I want to say is we need to be realistic about that. The second thing I want to say about leverage is that we're used to thinking about leverage in the way that I've been describing it, which is leverage with the idea of expanding something to make it bigger, right? And so th this is a, um, a graph that shows assets, for example, of a bank of, of borrowers. And here's an idea, if you, if you hit institutions, you invest in institutions that are serving <coughs> richer customers with more assets, you can get a lot more leverage. You can multiply your money. You can ex help them expand faster. What I wanna, I thought I wanna leave you with is that there's another group of institutions. They're down here. These are institutions where you're not going to be able to multiply your money. You're not going to be able to attract a lot of commercial investment. They're serving very, very poor households. And you know, with existing technologies, it's very hard to um, attract commercial investors who have a lot of other options. You could attract other social investors, but if the game is to attract for-profit commercial investors, it's very hard. And yet, what you can do is to bring those institutions into existence. They may be able to operate. They may be able to do a great job of serving their communities. They just aren't going to become huge. But they can be meaningful. And so what I want to suggest in, in closing is that as we think about leverage and expansion and multiplication, one view is getting to massive scale. And that's important. But another view is also supporting local institutions that are going to be small, um, but that can also make a big difference. And that's I'm going to steal a title from a famous book from the 70s, Small is Beautiful. Well, we have to hold on to that, too. Small can be beautiful, too. So the sum is that um, this is a new, relatively new set of ideas. It has some appeal to the left and to the right. It's progressive. It's business-focused. It is largely bipartisan. The idea is a broad access. Think about broadening access to institutions rather than thinking about redistribution of income. And together, we can both try to overcome market failures and also attract investment capital. The notion that 
profitability creates leverage on its own isn't right. Social investment is often needed. But the idea that markets can do amazing things on their own, probably not right either. But with a little bit of help, with targeted support that focuses on key impediments, we are seeing amazing institutions like Arvind Eye Hospital, like, uh, like microfinance institutions like Grameen Bank, housing uh, collectives and operations, new technologies, which can have a chance can grow, can become massive if given targeted, business-minded, philanthropic support. And that's where I want to leave that. So thank you. If there's some time for questions, if you have any rebuttals. Um, I think it was a month or two ago, I read in the Wall Street Journal that the Gates Foundation, um, they, have, they haven't been seeing a return on their, uh, their investment in polio vaccines in developing countries. Um, and it, it seems that they're starting to switch to raising um, the, uh, the environment in these in these countries in order to prevent um, polio from existing, you know, raising the standard of living. Um, I guess my question is, there's definitely an opportunity cost as opposed to um, trying to invest in increasing the standard of living and direct investment, uh, not direct investment, uh, direct aid towards these problems. And um, I think the, the big argument would be um, seeing results now or seeing results 20 to 30 years down the road. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, what your opinion is on that. And my, my general sense is that uh, um, addressing a problem like polio, is huge, complicated, um, like a lot of health problems, requires lots of different tacks. There's a sense in which we've got lots of evidence on clinical foundations of medical interventions. We have very limited information actually on kind of behavioral responses, on kind of fields appropriate um, interventions. We don't have a very good sense on preventative measures, for example, um, on the medical side. And so you know, my sense is this is an area where we need to do two things. One is innovate in a number of ways. One is through medical technology. Another is through delivery services, often the sort of last mile of getting those technologies out to people. And also generally, as you're saying, raise living standards and improve broader conditions. And that can come through expanding finance, improving agricultural technologies, all of that. We need to do everything. But we need to do also with that, and this is an important part of the idea of social investment, the important part of getting a social return, we need to collect the evidence to make sure that you know, what we're investing in is actually working. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Gates Foundation's been terrific on this for the most part. Putting real money into research, doing the trials necessary to figure out if things are really happening. So, it's a great issue. for polio and uh, followed with uh, personally engaging with that activity of immunizing children or vaccinating the children. Uh, is this now that new arrangement, that new social investment that you, you have the capital, you just don't give to uh, legitimate organizations like the Rotary International, but you personally go and demonstrate um, I wouldn't see that as an equivalent of social investment per se, but I do think that a lot of what Bill Gates is thinking about is social investment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that giving money to Rotary could be, if deployed in the right way, you know, possibly a social investment if Rotary is then going to use that money to create a clinic that gives access uh, to people who didn't have access before. 
Right? That's the kind of model that I'm thinking of. Right? And Bill Gates, in lots of his, um, or the foundation's um, engagements, is trying to think about the business model you know, that can make all this work out. And he sees himself as you know, a player that can make things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen, either by doing the research or by providing some core support um, to often a, you know, a for-profit or potentially for-profit institution that just needs that help to get going and then spread throughout Africa and uh, make a difference. So, yeah, it's, I, I think Bill Gates has been inspiring to lots of uh, people. Uh, I mean, it's, um, there's no doubt uh, that uh, microfinancing is a very novel idea. But uh, lately, I mean, there have been several studies that have shown that big banks have jumped into this. So you talked about the different sectors by enterprise and investment. But there was a study in the New York Times last month, and we had another one in the Wall Street Journal a few months yeah. back, where they talked about big banks now jumping in and uh, lending at uh, triple digit interest rates, 100% or more. So my question to you is, are we not, and I'm taking a twist on one of your slides that you had, <coughs> have we reached a point when microfinance has met, not just the market, but the free market, where, uh, and then my follow-up question is, how do we then uh, address the issue of uh, exploitation of, of these big banks exploiting those poor customers? Great question. And it's a question that a lot of people who have been working on microfinance to try to make it happen over the last couple of decades have been asking themselves and it's been involved with a lot of soul searching because for decades they've been trying to make this a commercial possibility because they know that reaching massive scale requires you know, getting the markets um, engaged. And yet when the markets get engaged, they do it on their own terms. Right? Now 100% interest rates are far from the norm in microfinance. <laughs> so, you know, at one level, the easy answer is that the newspapers exaggerate or pick out some cases that are not um, typical. Most microfinance interest rates are 20, 30, 40 percent. Still higher than we'd probably want to pay if we were taking loans, but much better than other options. But I think that <coughs> the fact is that as we move toward more commercialization, things will trend upward, probably. I mean, there are two, two effects, right? One, as commercial players come in, they are differently motivated, so prices increase. On the other hand, with more competition, they might actually fall. But I wouldn't be surprised if things trend upward. But I think one of the things which is happening, which is very positive, is that not only are social investors putting in money, but they're also you know, coming together as a group, trying to create a sort of new set of rules for self-regulation, trying to create better regulation. And that includes transparency on interest rates. And also now, actually, conversations been going on in the last couple of weeks, um, new ideas, new conversations on responsible pricing, responsible interest rates. Now, in the US, we're having those same issues, right, with uh, financial regulation. But it's happening in microfinance. It's necessary. Um, just engaging with the market is both powerful and also tricky. The other thing I should say on, on microfinance, which is happening, is a great irony, which is you know, the idea was to take banks to places where there hadn't been banks before. And now we're having the other problem, which is something we're a bit more familiar with in the US, which is over-indebtedness. Now people can go to Grameen Bank and go to its competitor, BRAC, and go to its competitor, ASHA, and often people are going to all three, and they're getting in over their heads. It's a problem we never imagined we'd have because we were so um, concerned with there being no banks. Um, but that's another thing, probably 10 to 20 percent of customers are probably in over their heads. So just like in the U.S., we need to start thinking about that as well. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, uh, with, with the disaster that happened in Haiti, things have really become unglued and it's pretty much decided that the types of aid they had been getting were maybe more crippling than helping uh, what do you see on the horizon for 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 changing changing the way that uh, American financial institutions or Americans themselves help the Haitians recover? It, it gives a chance to do a great experiment. 
Yeah, I, I'm not a great expert on, on Haiti at all. Um, at the United States Agency for International Development, we've got a, a great administrator. Um, he was appointed by President Obama, Raj Shah, who's with the Gates Foundation, um, who I, I know is taking that charge very seriously. I think what we're going to um, see is continuing focus on infrastructure, on business development, probably moving out of Port-au-Prince. Um, but I don't think I have anything that's more interesting than what you already are thinking you about. A, you don't have a grand theoretical idea of your own. Not on Haiti. No, but I mean, I think it, in general, I think what Haiti needs is both is jobs and um, and you know the basic infrastructure that can make that um, economy work better, and also you know basics like rule of law. One of the things also, you know, with Haiti, is that there's so many Haitians in the U.S. Um, who are earning a lot. Just moving to the U.S., I don't know what the factor is, but by ten times or more raises people's income. I think being able to take advantage of that community in the U.S. and helping that community make more of a difference back home, um, I think, could be very powerful. Um, I think one thing about the system justice system is that it has been what a lot of people have been saying, and that engagement is an important element. I mean, Bill Gates has done that. You have to know the people that you're giving to and that you're helping with to find out. Because we might think they need one thing, but they actually She gives that great comparison that you need not just intellect and accountability, but you need compassion, and that's part of this engagement. That's kind of what you're saying. And I think Bill Gates is a good example that he goes to where he's giving and being engaged with, with them helps us. Under. And I think that's one reason why often we don't get to this. We're so disengaged from people, we don't even understand how poverty is. I think that's absolutely right. And I'm glad you made that plug for a wonderful book, um, The Blue Sweater. Um, by Jacqueline Novogratz. She founded Acumen Fund, which is, as I mentioned earlier, a venture capital firm which is trying to make a social difference around the world. And if you're looking for a good read, um, it's a great book. Um, it's right there. Uh, <laughs> but um, on that, I mean, my general view is that engagement and passion are really, really important, and they s provide a foundation. But to go to the next step, it's really a, now a moment where you know, smart finance, having those accounting tools and corporate finance tools um, are really what's necessary to make this a much more rigorous area and a bigger area and less of a kind of an interesting space, but to make it a more mature space. Yeah, thanks. So this is an idea. Mohammed Yunus often talks about a social stock market, yeah. right? So it's a it's a beautiful idea, right? That you, instead of you know going down the newspaper and saying I want to invest in IBM and Microsoft, instead the companies say, you know, this is the financial return and this is the social good I'm I'm doing. Right? And the problem, to me, is that to be smart here, you really have to know a little bit more about what you're doing. So. If there's a way to kind of certify, create accountability, to really make clear in simple ways what an uh, impact is so it's comparable, then I think something like the social stock market might have some power. We're a long way away from that. I think what Eunice is great at is sort of creating a vision that of something that may be very, very far away, but that can at least give us something to dream toward. You know, in other talks, he talks about um, museums of poverty, where we'll take our grandchildren to show them um, what life was like when we lived in a world of great poverty, after poverty has been eliminated. Well, it's a beautiful dream. But I think, you know, to me, I get much more excited about, you know, simple steps that are going to happen in the next 10 years, which I think are, are not going to involve social stock markets, are going to involve organizations, mutual funds, investment banks. Um, making deals rather than uh, this becoming a big democratic process. That's my sense.
their interests are aligned. Right? They all want to see the firm do well so that they can make interest payments, make dividend payments to the equity holders. I'm trying to know where I'm going with this, but in a social investment, who provides the governance? Is it the equity holders electing a board of directors? Because if so, their interests could be seen to be opposed to. Yes. No, I think that's a, it's a great, great question. And it's one that I think people are going to have to wrestle with more and more. That as this becomes a success, then you're going to have to recognize that people who are investing may have very, very different goals and objectives and priorities. And that's going to affect um, governance. So far, that hasn't really been a problem because almost everybody who's on board is, has some social motivation in some way. It may be 90%, <coughs> it may be 50%. But um, that hasn't been so much of a problem. But as this matures, we really do need to think about this issue. This is why I, I imagine, I mean, I'm talking as an academic economist here, that we are going to see a flowering of academic work in this area. That we are going to see something that looks like corporate finance, where those issues get you know, sorted out you know, in, in the academic world when it comes to commercial businesses. We're going to see a corporate finance of social finance eventually. Right. Already some of the leading economists are working on these issues, but <coughs> got a lot further to go because they're really hard issues. I mean, to me what's exciting about this area is that it's growing and there's a chance for people like you to get involved and make a difference and start kind of thinking through where the hard issues are. But this is a, it's an area which is, which is new. And like all new things, there are a lot of obstacles and also huge potential, I think, um, to make a big difference. There are other micro, I only really know the microfinance ones. There's one called Microplace where you can get a bit more of a return. It's started by some UBA um, folks. Um, there are, it's not really well developed now, but there are lots of different ways to get involved, you know, personally, rather than as an investor at this point. Yeah, I should, I should do some looking around because it would be nice to have a list um, and to be able to share it. There are also opportunities to um, support institutions like the Acumen Fund um, by supporting those institutions and then it sort of one remove be part of this process. Um, but not as an investor, but instead as a, somebody who's trying to support their mission. Great. Let me, one last question, thanks. I'm wondering if you have data on um, gender breakdown on the recipients on the low end of the scale, that is the, the small micro loans Seems like there's a lot of focus on <laughs> on giving um, very poor women um, access to those loans, which would help them make your claim about how these work to broaden access. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. About 95% on the very low end, but it goes up to, you know, the middle rate is probably about 60, top end is probably about 40. So it's a big gender uh, shift as you go up market. And this is one of the reasons that. Mohammed Yunus and others keep saying, as we get commercial, let's not lose sight of the lower end because there's something fundamentally different going on, a very fundamentally different target group. And um, I think it's an important message. Thanks. So I think uh, we should uh, bring that to a close. But I want to um, thank you very much for, uh, for these questions, this opportunity to share views. extremely fortunate of us to have you here and a very nice talk. Thank you. We really enjoyed it. I'd also like to thank all of you and especially like to thank the Robert Schakenbach Foundation for sponsoring this event, giving us the chance. Thank you. Thank you very much.